Welcome and thank you for joining us for Telling the Truth, an ongoing symposium uh, presented by the New York State Writers Institute at the University at Albany. My name is Paul Grandal. I'm the director of the Writers Institute. Before I introduce uh, today's guests, Craig Newmark and Jeff Jarvis, let, let me remind you that all of our conversations are recorded and posted on the Writers Institute YouTube channel where they're archived and you can watch them at your convenience. You can also find them on our website, nyswritersinstitute.org, or please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And finally, if, if you wanna support future programming like this, you can find where to make a donation on our website, nyswritersinstitute.org. We'd be very grateful for that. So let me start with Craig Newmark. He's the founder of Craigslist, the web-based platform that has fundamentally changed classified advertising. Since his founding in 1995, Craigslist has become one of the world's 10 most visited English language web platforms. Today, there are Craigslist websites virtually everywhere and serving every continent on earth, except Antarctica, at least according to his biography from Newmark's induction into the Internet Hall of Fame in 2012. In addition, in addition to being a web pioneer, Newmark is a speaker, a philanthropist, and a self-described, quote, old school nerd. Through his Craig Newmark philanthropies, he has contributed tens of millions of dollars to support the people and organizations that protect values that America aspires to, namely fairness, opportunity, and respect. Newmark's philanthropy focuses on supporting key areas, including trustworthy journalism and the information ecosystem, voter protection, women in tech, and veterans and military families. He serves on a dozen boards of organizations in these areas and many more advisory councils and boards. Jeff Jarvis is director of the Tau Knight Center for Entrepreneurial Journalism and Tau Professor of Journalism Innovation at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at City University of New York. Jarvis is a national leader in the development of online news, blogging, the investigation of new business models for news, and the teaching of entrepreneurial journalism. He writes an influential blog, buzzmachine.com. He's the author of several books, including Geeks Bearing Gifts, Imagining New Futures for News, and What Would Google Do? He's consulted for several media companies and previously worked as a columnist, editor, and writer for a number of publications. He also was the creator and founding managing editor of Entertainment Weekly. It's a great pleasure to introduce and to welcome Craig Newmark, Jeff Jarvis. Thank you for being with us. Thanks, Paul. So uh, why don't we get started? In 2018, uh, Craig, you made a $20 million endowment gift to the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism, which now bears your name. How did this collaboration begin and how did you choose CUNY for that support? The collaboration really began somewhere between 10 and 15 uh, years ago when uh, Jeff introduced himself at the security line at the Time Life building. Uh, I was still in the line. I think he had just passed through and he uh, recognized me for some reason, perhaps confusing me with uh, George Costanza from Seinfeld. <laughs> And we stayed in contact for some time because I was beginning to be more and more interested in the way journalism and the press works, knowing how important it is for the survival and success of our democracy. We just started talking. We started talking more. I was uh, present at the creation of the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism, uh, became friends also with Sarah Bartlett there, and at some point, they, int they introduced the notion of, a, uh, of an endowment. That's pretty good because CUNY, I've read, is more responsible for getting New Yorkers into the uh, middle class and beyond than any institution around. And that's the gist of the American uh, success story, getting people, giving people opportunities that they wouldn't have had otherwise which is kind of uh, my story too. 
That's great. So I would say that CUNY is part of the State University of New York, and we at UAlbany are part of this this great this great organization. So so Jeff, um, this was described as a transformative gift for your program, meant to enhance the school's mission of training journalists, diversifying the voices in media, and encouraging innovation and entrepreneurship. How are you doing that at the Newmark Graduate School of Journalism? Well, first, let me say I think I think Craig, I was I was mistaking you for George Clooney uh, in the line, but, <laughs> of course. but um, uh, I found out it was Craig Newmark in any case. And uh, uh, so, if you go back that ten to fifteen years, Craig, one of the amazing things that Craig does is reach out to people to better understand the fields that he's interested in. So he reached out to me, to Jay Rosen at New York University, uh, to others. And uh, over the years, we've had many conversations where Craig as a insider slash outsider can look and say, why do you guys do this this way? Or how do we fix this? Or what's wrong with this? Right? So that was, the, that was the nature of our conversation for a long time. And, and so Craig generously helped start uh, what became the News Integrity Initiative, which after the uh, last 2016 presidential election, was an effort to grapple with disinformation, which is one of Craig's key uh, causes is, is uh, honesty and truth in, in media. And then that led to the gift to the school. That gift has enabled us to do many things. Let me start by saying this, in the current crisis brought on by the pandemic, uh, it has enabled us to keep our nose above water and to, and to survive uh, this crisis. Uh, as I'm sure you know, at your university, the state is cutting back all of our budgets. And um, so having the endowment uh, managed by Sarah Bartlett, our dean, has enabled us to have the breathing room so that we can keep going and doing our work. We're a new school. We're only 15 years old. Come next fall. We uh, believe deeply in diversity and equity. We believe deeply in innovation and change. And so what Craig's gift gave us more than anything else was the independence and the freedom to pursue those things. In many other universities, a little tiny, you know, CUNY is huge. CUNY is a quarter million students. We're a little tiny boutique of uh, basically 100 students in a class, a little more. And for us to be independent is what frees us to be innovative and troublemakers and to pursue new ideas and to ask hard questions. And, and otherwise, like many other universities, we'd be part of an arts and sciences college in, a, um, uh, you know, in an English program or something like that. Instead, we are our own independent school. Our dean, Dean Bartlett, reports to the chancellor as, as does the pres president of CCNY and Baruch and Brooklyn College and so on. So the main gift we got there um, was the independence to innovate. That's great. Uh, Craig, this is just one example of, of the philanthropy you're doing to push back, fight against, protect our democracy against attacks on it. So we've got this President Trump, who was probably the greatest uh, instigator of, of those assaults on democracy. Um, he's still not recognizing that he lost, of course. Um, but is that going to change anything? Do you think uh, you know having Trump out of the White House is going to all of a sudden uh, solve the issue of assaults on democracy and and uh, etc. Or or is it going to continue or even get worse? Um, I think things are already starting to get better. There's already an emerging network of uh, people who are really smart about fighting against uh, disinformation or as the intelligence people say, influence operations. The network involves a lot of places, including CUNY journalism, but there's also a Stanford Spogli Group, particularly the Stanford Internet Observatory. There are people doing really good work at the Shorenstein Center to the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, there's people at Columbia doing good work, Data and Society. Um, there's a lot of good people working together uh, fighting back, the next steps involve taking the uh, taking the fight to the enemy, whether it's foreign adversaries or uh, domestic groups working with our foreign adversaries. People are starting to uh, to make that happen. 
I was a little bit late to the party, in fact. I was only uh, notified about this when uh, someone named Jarvis told me to read the NATO handbook on Russian information warfare, where the Russians pretty much uh, tell us they've declared war. Uh, here's how they're going to attack. They did so in 2016. In 2020, in many respects, uh, they were uh, pushed back. The illustration there is that our election was run, uh, the election processes were run fairly cleanly. And so uh, we are taking a, a forward defense posture where we are fighting the enemy where they are. Right, let me, let me ask Jeff, um, this whole notion of truth, you know, the great Daniel Patrick Moynihan quote, you're entitled to your own opinions, not your own facts. The divide is so deep between red and blue and political tribalism that the, either side won't accept the facts of the other. How do you deal with that as journalists? How, how do you call out when something is a lie or unsupported? And, and, and how, how do journalists react to this new strange field we're in of, of misinformation and, and mistruth? I, I think there's a few layers. Uh, you know, one of Craig's great desires and strengths is networking all of his uh, grantees together. So there's a, there's a, a, a mailing list that is chocked full of activity that's going on. And some of that is around uh, fact checking and bird dogging and reporting and so on. And I think that's critical. But I also think that we've got to go deeper and understand what's happening in the country. Uh, and, and part of that is uh, stories that I don't think we've covered terribly well in media starting with systemic racism in America. Uh, we have an initiative in, for black media at, at, at the school uh, that cover and serve communities that have been left out of mass media run by people who look like all of us, right? right? And um, so I think that's one issue. The other, as part of that, is that I've come to believe lately that what's, what's really been happening is I don't think people, most people, who carry a cue in front of them and, a, and a, necessarily believe what's being said. They want us to believe they believe it. It's performative. So some of this isn't about facts. It's not even about beliefs. It's about emotions. And so the challenge for the next phase, of, I hope of the center that I run is to look and say, how do we rethink and redesign journalism around those challenges? And what do we have to learn from other disciplines? What do we have to learn from psychologists and neuroscientists and cognitive scientists about how people's brains operate so that they can end up believing that they should burn masks and, and, and affect grandma, right? That, we've got to rethink of what journalism does fundamentally and media do fundamentally around that. If communities don't understand each other and get along, we've got to look at, I think, anthropology and sociology. Now, I'm not a real academic. I'm fake. I'm just a journalist professor, right? Um, but I, I'm coming to appreciate in this gigantic institution we have of CUNY, the value we have in looking at these other disciplines so that I think we've got to do more than get journalism out as it is and fact check as it is. We have to do all of that. We've also got to go to a next layer where we understand what's happening in our country and redesign journalism to address those bigger challenges. Craig, let me ask you, thank, thank you, Jeff. Um, this growing uh, virus in a way of conspiracy theories, you've got QAnon, you've got you know, large sections of the web devoted to this now, including with the vaccine, supposedly implanting microchips in people. How do you combat that while you also want information to flourish freely on the web? Um, the problem in general, is something that I just can't address and defer that to the practitioners. The part I do know about is a matter of journalistic ethics, although it's also a matter of the ethics of news distribution, which is done both by newspapers and social media platforms. Uh, the deal is that if newspapers and social media platforms stop amplifying disinformation, if they stop making it worse, maybe the problem has a chance to, uh, oh, to draw back a bit. The deal is that as I, uh, well, I'm pretty old school, even older school than Jeff. 
And I do remember in Sunday school, Mr. and Mrs. Levin telling us that bearing false witness is bad. False witness is the uh, ancient term for disinformation. Uh, not bearing false witness is the ancient ethical uh, ban on disinformation. And we just need to remind people in mass media and in social media, uh, avoid doing the wrong thing. And the problem will to some large extent abate. To this effect, I'm supporting a network of journalism ethics programs in places like Pointer and Columbia and some emerging, which I haven't announced yet. Where my focus is on finding people who are good at something, helping out, and for the most part, getting out of the way. So there will be announcements to come. If you wanna make news and make announcements here, feel free, but I, I won't pressure you, Craig. Um, um, let, let, me, let me ask Jeff, um, what, what are the bright spots that you see? I know Craig is, is, is supporting a lot of ways to try to sustain journalism. I mean, you were in a newsroom, I've been in a newsroom for 40 years. You know, we've lost 60% of our journalists at, at my newspaper, the Albany Times Union, which covers the capital of the great empire state. You can't be as, you know, on top of things and do as much watchdog journalism with 60% fewer journalists. So, so what's filling in for that? What, what are some of the bright spots? I, I'm working on a book on, on the end of the Gutenberg age. And so it's taught me to have a very long perspective on the time frame we're in. I, I think we're in the very early years of this transition. I think it's a huge transition equivalent, I would imagine, to what we went through with print. I'm too old to know how this turns out. But I, 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 think, um, I, I think we're at about the year 1475 in Gutenberg years. We're about 25 years after the introduction of the commercial web. So we don't really know what the internet is yet. We don't know what it can do yet. We haven't renegotiated our norms around it. It's still confusing us. It's still scaring us. Um, it, it was 150 years after Gutenberg and, and his Bible before anyone invented a regularly published newspaper, a century and a half, right? Because we saw it at the beginning as a technology, but then when the technology got boring, we kind of said, well, what can we do with this? And so there was a rush of innovation around 1600, 150 years later. So I think that's where we are now on the internet. And so my hope is long-term. Now we could have problems between here and there. You know, they had a 30 years war. They had the reformation. Uh, they had peasants wars. There's a lot of stuff that went on. And my hope is that we can avoid our 30 years war by being smart enough to see the opportunities we have. So there's some great little startups that give me hope. There's one called Spaceship Media that convenes communities in a civil conversation. Outlier Media in Detroit uh, uses text to answer citizens' questions. Uh, City Bureau in Chicago uh, uh, trains community members to do journalism. We own two papers in the South Bronx. We're trying to do things from all of those ideas. There's good work going on at Die Zeit in Germany and so on. I can find these pockets of innovation. And they give me hope because they're people trying to rethink and reinvent journalism and its relationship to the public we serve. Uh, but I think we have to invest in a future that isn't just about preserving the past, but is about taking advantage of the opportunities we have to come. Wonderful. Um, Craig, let me ask you, I, I see through Craig Newmark Philanthropies that you support a lot of teachers and, and education. What, what are some positive things that are happening to, to address, you know, being critical news consumers of, of young children, elementary school, middle school, um, we've been trying to do some things at the Writers Institute on, on that end, but what are you seeing that gives you hope that, that, that kids are now realizing what's propaganda, what's misinformation, what, what's bogus coming across their news feeds? I don't know. Um, I listen and read what uh, Dana Boyd at Data Society uh, talks about because she actually uh, works with schools and teachers and kids, listens to them, and what uh, her studies have, sh uh, have uh, concluded is that kids are pretty good at this themselves without our help, help meaning uh, interference. Adults telling kids what they uh, should and shouldn't believe about critical thinking may be counterproductive. And uh, sometimes you need to leave well enough uh, alone. 
That's been my casual observation, but I can only defer to people who actually know stuff about this and maybe help uh, fund them, help support them. But sometimes everyone is better off if you let the experts do their thing. Yeah, yeah well, I, I, want, I want to agree with that. Go ahead, Jeff. Because I think it's, it's um, uh, uh, Dana Boyd at Data Society is brilliant and I too follow her and, and, and call upon her. And she teaches us that if we teach our young people to doubt everything they see, uh, then we open up a void into which people can fill in what they want. So we need to be careful about that. And I think that education writ large uh, is critical here. Uh, another person that Craig supports in her work is Claire Wardle. Uh, and, and she also understands how to deal with these misinformation campaigns that come out. And I don't know whether you support Josh Tucker at NYU, Craig. I think you have. Okay, another one in the Craig New World. So, so Josh Tucker at NYU did great research to see who spreads the worst of the misinformation, mm. right? And it turns out, uh, in my paraphrasing of his gag, uh, the, the kids are all right. It's grandpa who's screwing up the world, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so, so we, we think we make these assumptions that, oh, there's echo chambers and the kids are, are, are spreading bad stuff. Research, if we listen to the researchers, as Craig just said, if we listen to the experts who have the data, we're going to create better interventions than if we act on assumption. So let me ask Craig, since you built this incredible tech and, and, and uh, uh, web platform, what's your feeling about the pressure to break up Facebook, the antitrust suit against Google, you know, putting uh, Zuckerberg and Dorsey, the CEOs of Facebook on Twitter under grilling a Senate Judiciary Committee. Do, do they bear a lot of burden for uh, not doing enough to, you know, curate or, or uh, rather, you know, monitor content and should they be doing more? Um, first, you're giving me too much credit. Um, I stepped down from Craigslist management and anything to do with decision-making in 2000. Okay. Uh, roughly uh, 21 years ago, I went into full-time customer service and delegated the entire management function to Jim Buckmaster because people helped me understand that as a manager, I suck. <laughs> um, and I've since fully retired from the company because they don't need me anymore, but I can do useful things in philanthropy. Regarding the social media platforms, a lot of this stuff is just uh, above my pay grade, and I'd prefer to focus on saying something smart rather than saying something stupid, which I know goes against the universal grain. But um, when I talk about the social media platforms, I just encourage people to not amplify disinformation. That's one thing. Now and then I might remind people to not put a thumb on the scale favoring disinformation. For example, if the rumors are true, Twitter is about to uh, do something bad, um, unfollowing a lot of people from the uh, POTUS handle. And that seems like uh, it's kind of uh, un-American to do so, but maybe that's only a rumor. I sure hope so. Mm. Yeah. I, go ahead. Yeah. Sometimes you just keep your mouth shut and you're doing everyone a favor. Can I ask you a question, Craig? Uh, I haven't asked you this before. Um, so you've been, you made the shift in, into philanthropy some years ago now. I wonder what advice you would give other people in technology when they finally enter philanthropy. What are some of the surprising lessons you've learned or, or how you would advise them to proceed? Um, I would tell people they already uh, know a lot about uh, the fundamentals which is to say, uh, treat people like you want to be treated and uh, help people avoid bearing a false witness. The shocking thing which I learned is that when they're funding people in philanthropy, people who are good at doing something and who act in good conscience, those are the folks who don't know how to talk about what they do well. And they're also subject, like myself, to dirty tricks operations or in, uh, disinformation or influence operations. And almost universally, 
someone who is good at doing something and who is honest about it is no match for someone who is good at lying about it. Because someone who is good at lying about it, well, if you're fact or evidence oriented, that limits in ter- you in terms of what you can say because you're being honest. Whereas somebody who is good at dirty tricks can come up, they can just inv- invent disinformation on the fly and you're no good at countering it. There are people who are good at countering it, but they are few and far between and on the opposite of someone who's good at countering disinformation. So people need to defend themselves. People need to work together to counter disinformation and to counter harassment. And we're at the beginning of some ideas about that, but only the beginning. Thank you, Craig. Um, so Jeff, I'll ask you the same question. You know, this mounting pressure to, to challenge, regulate, break up, you know, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Google, you know, not playing fairly, um, you know, being uh, bad actors, at least these are the allegations against them, justified, not justified, going too far, not far enough. What do you, what do you think? Well, I suppose I should say in full disclosure is that uh, uh, the News Integrity Initiative was funded by Craig and also by Facebook. Okay. Uh, I received nothing personally from any of the platforms. Um, I think generally unjustified. Uh, and judge me as you will based on what I just said, but uh, I don't defend Facebook so much or Twitter or Google so much as I defend the internet against what I see as a growing moral panic that's occurring in much of media and media who are not being fully honest about their own conflict of interest in how they are covering their competitor or competitors. Uh, and, And so if I look back at the research that I've been doing on the Gutenberg age, uh, it's amazing how much of the same things we hear today were heard at the beginning of print. The print was going to ruin us. It was, it was the ruin. It had to be controlled. We had to get rid of fake news. We had to, all of this goes back many times before. These are lessons we forget. And what concerns me most is the freedom of expression that the internet brings us. Because there are people now who finally have a press who never in history had it before. There are communities who were left out of mass white media. And and it is critical that we recognize that if you shut off these platforms, you shut off their voices too. So I'm very, very concerned about the fights over Section 230, which is the protection of the conversation online. You have the right going after it because their hate speech is being taken down. You have the left going after it because they think these companies are too big and too powerful. Um, Well, we thought that um, you know, FriendFeed was going to take over the world and, and MySpace was going to take over the world and Microsoft was the greatest threat, threat that we had. Uh, this goes around and comes around. And, and I think that the real job here is not to concentrate on the technology or even the companies, but about our own behavior as a society on the internet. The problems we're talking about here are not technology problems, they're human problems. And that's what we've got to figure out. And that's the essence of Craig's work too, is if we, if we keep lying to each other and harassing each other, doesn't matter what the platform is. We could use the telephone. We could use carrier pigeons. Uh, Craig loves pigeons, so he wouldn't like that very much. Um, uh, the technology is, 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 is secondary to our fundamental problems as a society. Um, ahead, Jeff, is, uh, Jeff does great work on a podcast called This Week in Google, <laughs> where listening to it recently, I've developed a drinking game we're in whenever Jeff says moral panic, I uh, I enjoy some uh, single malt. Yeah, yeah. Craig, Craig's got inebriated on that. Yeah. I wish I had some handy. We we could have uh, had a, <laughs> after it's, it's five o'clock somewhere, I guess. Um, yeah. But um, uh, l- let me ask you, Craig. Um, y- for one, I'm amazed. With you must be drinking out of a fire hose all day, but I've never seen anyone respond immediately to emails. So, so how, how do you take in not just news information, but in, in general, your, your mind must be wired in nanoseconds to be able to respond like this. How, how do you, you know, choose what to follow or what, what to focus on? Do you, do you have sort of a plan for each day, what you're going to put your energies into? I can't wait to hear this answer because I've never figured out how he does it either. <laughs> uh, it helps to be a both nerd and couch potato. I spend uh, nearly all my time in front of screens of one sort or another. Um, 
and I've just deli decided to liber deliberately obsess about uh, email and so on as a customer service rep. Uh, I've been a customer service rep one way or the other for about 38 years, uh, mostly starting at IBM, but also doing a stint when I was uh, getting my uh, computer science degrees. But the idea is that if I want to treat people like I want to be treated, that means responding uh, fairly quickly and actually answering questions. And that's what I try to uh, do now. And even now, when I get customer service, good or bad, from a company, I uh, try to work with people to improve it for, uh, for everyone. I'm involved in doing that regarding some Internet of Things issues at two different uh, companies, which uh, could come up at a podcast that I listened to oh. called This Week in Google. <laughs> um, but the deal... You're sprinkling the, breadcrumbs or Easter eggs for us here. Plugs. We call them plugs. Well, the deal is that customer service really does matter. It's an outgrowth of that uh, treat people like you want to be treated thing. And that's how and why I respond uh, uh, to things that quickly. And colleagues know that if I don't respond to something, let's say, after maybe a couple hours at most, either on the sleep or, well, it used to be that I was in a plane without Wi-Fi, but that doesn't uh, happen anymore. And uh, people are beginning to uh, worry about my increasing uh, decrepitude, but that's a subject of uh, uh, Craig's Endgame Year One. <laughs> so, so let me ask Jeff, um, since you have been, I've, I've been following uh, your students are doing some tremendous things uh, and, and they've pivoted to this virtual world. I admit I'm not a screen person. I'm a people person. That's why I love journalism. I was out in the stream of life every day and meeting all kinds of people and hearing their stories. I don't really like living on a screen, but how has this, this pandemic you think re, will recalibrate journalism like so many businesses? I mean, will, will we all, you know, just be on a screen and not be out in the world anymore? Or? So we had students who were already halfway through. We just graduated a class uh, last week where they were halfway through their, their program, their year and a half program in graduate school and boom, here came COVID. Yeah. And that was hard for them, but they adapted. And, and I told them that this was going to be one of their greatest strengths. And then we have a current class that came in who chose to come in in the middle of the pandemic. And, I, and, I, and I'm amazed at their courage in doing so. But I think all these students are going to leave better for it more resilient, more able to find people in new ways, to connect people in new ways, to understand the world in new ways. And I think media as a whole then has, a, has had a huge opportunity to reach out in ways that weren't possible. Just look at what happens on, on TV news now, right? You now see the sources with their homes in the background. Right. Uh, by the way, Rate My Skype Room gave me a high rating for this. I, I, wanna, I wanna brag about that too. And, and so what that means is that, that, that even television, which used to make you come into the studio and had only a few people on their, on their roster, they're just beginning to see that they can reach out to people across the country and across the world they couldn't get before. That's a great possibility. Uh, my students in social journalism, one of the programs we have at the school I'm very proud of, uh, recognize one of the students this term uh, is working with people who have food uh, uh, security issues in Milwaukee. Well, she found 20 Facebook groups where people are feeding them each other and they're trying to help each other. You know, that's incredible. Look at what Craig does with Donors Choose, which is an organization that helps teachers bring in new equipment and new things they need to teach in these circumstances. Um, I think that there's tremendous opportunity here to see the world in a new way. Now, I also think that when we can come back, which I hope is next fall, we're going to appreciate each other more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're in transition from normal to new normal. Screens and Zoom will be some large part of that. But also, there's the opportunity for people who didn't have much of a voice before to turn lip service in that direction into real change. Absolutely. For example, at the CUNY Journalism School, there's something called the Center for Community Media, and there's a guy named Aaron Foley running the Black Media Initiative, which I'm supporting, but also supporting as part of an emerging network 
which includes the Howard University Journalism Department, uh, Maynard Institute, the National Association of Black Journalists. And the deal is that getting all these groups together can create some real persistent change in ways that I couldn't do. The real reason I couldn't do is that persistent change is created by people who have like social skills and I'm a nerd and all I know for sure is that a nerd's got to do what a nerd's got to do. <laughs> um, let, let me ask Jeff, uh, since we've both been around uh, journalism media for, for so long, um, I'm, I'm proud that we're at the University of Albany. We're one of the most diverse public research universities, almost 50% students of color, 35 to 40% first generation college students. It's wonderful to be in that environment. But I also know we were a, a medium sized newspaper and still are the Albany Times Union. We tried very hard to recruit journalists of color and had very little success. Some of our great black journalists went on to the Washington Post, the New York Times, they didn't stay long with us, but what is the pipeline? Are you getting more diversity and, and students of color in, in the journalism pipeline? Because it wasn't there throughout most of my career. Well, like you, we're a state supported institution. So, so yes, um, we're, we're very prideful about that. But A, we can always do a better job and we've got to do more, much more. We've got to change our curriculum. I, I think after the pandemic, how can one look at, for example, covering health now without starting in the lens of, of, of equity? How can you cover any area without starting with equity? And so we've got to update ourselves too. But yes, we have many students of color who then go out in the field and that's where the problem exists. They go into newsrooms where they're not appreciated, where, where editors tell them their story is too small, uh, that it's not big enough. I interviewed Nicole Hannah-Jones, the creator of the New York Times 1619 Project, right. recipient of the Pulitzer Prize and, and MacArthur Award. And she told me that, uh, this was for the ISOJ conference. She told the story of having been worked at the Oregonian in Portland and nearly leaving journalism entirely, which would have been a tremendous loss to the field because she couldn't get stories about black experience in the city into the paper, let alone on page one. And, and so we have a huge problem structurally with journalism as it is. Uh, the argument about objectivity that we've had in the past, Wesley Lowry, ex-Washington Post, who had to leave the Washington Post because he disagreed with Marty Baron over his tweets, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times a few months ago uh, in which he pointed out that the, the systemic racism inherent in the judgment behind what we call objectivity, because that judgment of what is objective is generally made by old white men in charge of the paper. And so we, we have to, I think, realize what does reparations in journalism look like? There was a study recently by an academic named Jordan Taylor who looked at the ads for the slave trade in newspapers in early America. Even Benjamin Franklin profited greatly from the slave trade. Our debt to reparations starts there and it goes up and through today. So the problem is that, that students do go out into the field but they're too often not appreciated. So we've got to change not only the pipeline of staff, we've got to work on the management. And so we have a program in, in News Innovation Leadership where we work at the management level, managing editors and vice presidents, trying to get them to understand better. And then we've also got to work at the ownership level. We've got to change the ownership in this field. Most every newspaper chain in America is now owned, controlled by either a hedge fund or an exhausted family. And innovation is going to come from neither. And so it's working with Aaron Foley at the Black Media Initiative, not only with 200-year-old African-American newspapers, but also with two-day-old startups to understand how we can use this opportunity of the internet to create new businesses as well. That's wonderful. Um, I, I do love the uh, breaking down of barriers that, that technology has provided. Anyone now with a cell phone and an internet connection, which is a, a vast majority, not everyone, we know underserved communities and low-income communities still have challenges with, with uh, access to the internet and high-speed uh, connections. But anyway, um, one of the biggest problems, and I'll address this to Craig, bullying online. I know you're funding a lot of initiatives, particularly women. I mean, it, it can get untenable and, and, and horrible and, and terrifying. How, how do we combat that? You know, the, the greatness of the openness of the internet can also lead to this horrible behavior. 
Um, this is an area of big concern to me, uh, harassment directed against uh, anyone online. And I have very little in the way of answers. Instead, what I've done is started to support, to fund a number of organizations focusing on this, trying to come up with actual solutions. The pointy end of the spear here is the harassment directed against women journalists. So I've engaged the International Women's Media Foundation to lead an effort trying to figure out how to deal with things. Me, what I've suggested is that somehow we need to find a way to alert people when someone has been harassed and then to uh, find that uh, the point of harassment and then just to offer our support, even good wishes to the person targeted. Because in my own experience, when I have been harassed, um, a lot of the damage, uh, at least the psychological damage, is mitigated by messages of support. Beyond that, sometimes there is a matter of data collection because the harassment has gone so far as to need help from the law enforcement or even the intelligence community. But there again, I defer to people who know what they're doing and people who may, uh, may actually have social skills. <laughs> um, Jeff, that same question to you. What are you seeing or hearing among your students and the next generation of journalists? Is it getting any better? Is it? Um... Um, that's what gives me hope is the students. So we, you know, as I said, we just had our graduation last week. We had the final presentations in social journalism and I see greatly innovative ideas there. And, and that's, what, that's why I started teaching because I, I banged my head against the wall too much. Uh, I'm too old. Uh, I had to hope that I could help them innovate. And, and that's what gives me hope. But we have tons of work to do. Uh, it's, it's, this, is, this is not easy to remake our field. And I don't think we're, the, we're not the only institution that's challenged. At a time of change such as this, every major institution in society has to decide whether it's going to listen and adapt and change or be rolled over and replaced. Wonderful, and and I'm I'm really impressed, uh, Craig, with your humility. And I like uh, on your Craig Newmark Philanthropy's website, you you find the experts and then kind of get out of the way, which is 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 very rare. But let me ask, you've been very generous with your time, uh, Jeff and Craig. I'll I'll ask a final question. So you kind of represent the two ends of I think what's really needed to defend democracy, to fight against misinformation, software engineers and journalists, which do we need more of? I'll, I'll ask Craig first. Um, I think what we uh, need more are just regular people who will tell newspapers and social media platforms to uh, support evidence and uh, fact-based stuff and to stop amplifying disinformation. Um, that's a message coming from neither journalists nor software engineers specifically but it comes from uh, people who are part of a democracy. Um, and I think that's the, uh, that's the big uh, message. We need to remember what we picked up in Sunday school um, to avoid bearing false witness. And of course, also to treat people like you want to be treated. Wonderful. Uh, Jeff? Yeah, I, I, I think that um, with, with, a, with a press in everyone's hands now, uh, anyone can perform acts of journalism as coding gets easier and easier and people get smarter and smarter and better educated about it. Anybody can do that. I think Craig's emphasis on, on ethics is where we really ought to be paying attention because what we're doing right now is we're in a process of renegotiating our norms as a society. How do we treat each other? Uh, what do we value? Uh, how do we model behavior for other people? How do we behave ourselves? How do we give and expect respect? That's pretty basic and it's basic through history. Um, we just have new tools with which to do this or abuse this and that's the choice we have. We're coming off the worst year in, in our lifetimes and in many generations, looking ahead to 2021. What, what would you hope for? One or two things on your wish list that, that you hope can, can come true in 2021? Uh, I'll start with you, Jeff. I'm very bad at predictions. Uh, I, 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 um, uh, and even wishes, I, I, I might jinx things. I just hope that 
we're going to try to relearn how to value um, the enlightenment. Hmm. Wonderful. And, and Craig? Uh, people, including me, will keep pressing on uh, social media platforms and uh, newspapers to avoid uh, amplifying disinformation. So that's one simple lesson, which is uh, probably enough. I'll refer back to my line about a, a nerd's uh, got to do what a nerd's got to do. That's wonderful. I, I also en enjoyed that we had a little bit of laughter and levity. And I hope next time we get together and can play that drinking game with a single malt scotch. Every time Jeff says moral panic, we'll, we'll have to uh, take a shot. But this has been wonderful. I appreciate this great conversation. The New York State Writers Institute at the University at Albany telling the truth, something we all need to. Uh, do more of in 2021. I want to thank Jeff Jarvis and Craig Newmark. Thank you very much for being part of this. Thank you.